All right. Today, I am pleased to welcome Julie Lorenz, Secretary of the Kansas Department of Transportation. She is going to lead today's presentation. Julie, if you're ready and you're on, start by telling us a little bit about your background. Hey, well, thank you for the, um, Ms. Murphy, I'm glad to be here today. I am the Secretary of the Kansas Department of Transportation and also the Director of the Kansas Turnpike Authority. I was appointed by Governor Laura Kelly in 2019, uh, uh, confirmed by the Senate. And it's my second tour of duty with KDOT. I was here previously and served as Director of Public Affairs and now I'm glad to be back um, as secretary. Really, my career's been sort of um, half in the private sector and half in the public sector, and uh, I, I enjoy both roles, but uh, I will say there is really something, I think, very special about public service, and so I'm really glad to be back to serve the state of Kansas, and uh, I'm thrilled, honored, humbled to be asked to speak, uh, you know, while virtual, um, from the Eisenhower Presidential Library. Um, I've got lots of good things, lots of good stories to share and to talk about how President Eisenhower's legacy continues to shape transportation in Kansas even today. So with that, um, I'll, and I'm assisted by Maggie Dahl here today in, at KDOT, so perhaps we can go on to the presentation. There we go, okay. So I am, whoops. Almost there we go. There we go. All right, Maggie, thank you. So we're coming to you today live from Eisenhower State Office Building in Topeka, and it is a gorgeous day. I don't know where everyone is calling in from, but it is gorgeous in Topeka today. All right, next slide, Maggie. All right, so um, when I walk to the Capitol, I have the pleasure to literally and figuratively be able to look up at General Eisenhower. Um, so that's a picture from just last week, and you'll see on the right side of your screen the Ike pin, which, I wear, which I'm also wearing today. And I wear it whenever I'm representing the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program. Um, and like I said, it is an honor and a privilege to get to speak today. Next slide. And you may not know this, but in many ways, it was through President Eisenhower's efforts that we actually have the internet highway. We certainly probably know a lot about the, uh, the national interstate system, but I've got a little story to tell you today about how he's also the father of the, of the internet in many ways. All right. So if you'll beam yourself back to October 4th, 1957. So um, like nearly, nearly this day, so not, um, not too many days until October 4th. And on a Friday night, for the first time, Leave It to Beaver aired, and it was a fairly new format called Sitcom. And Americans were pretty mesmerized by this no new show and watching Wally and Beaver's antics. And we were also really quite enjoying, you know, our world superpowerness. Also, that night, what we didn't realize is the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik and it had traveled twice around the world as we were watching the antics of Wally and Beaver. Next slide. And um, let me just say, President Eisenhower wasn't pleased um, as the globe had been circled twice by the Soviet Union. At that time, research, uh, the armed forces, each branch, in fact, was responsible for research and development. And Eisenhower took a step back and said, okay, I think we need to up our game. And he called in civilian leaders and civilian scientists and by early 1958, he had decided to create two new branches to launch us into the next era. Next slide. And that is how we, how, we um, how NASA was formed, as well as ARPA. Now, NASA was charged to watch and research space. ARPA, on the other hand, would look into the areas of science and technology. Both agencies contributed to our leadership in technology but ARPA has a special role in the internet. Next slide. By 1969, ARPA was able to send messages between two computers. And the message that was first sent was log in. Sounds familiar, however, also familiar today. Doesn't, technology doesn't always work the first time or every time. And the two computers crashed after low had been transmitted. 
So that was really the beginning of the internets as we know them, because that was the first time computer talked to computer, and it was a short message, low. All right. So Dwight Eisenhower, favorite son of Kansas, father of the interstate, and ostensibly father of the information highway. Next slide. Now, we've got several Ike stories to tell today, but the most important part, I think, is what I want to glean from his legacy, from his, from his teachings and from his, more importantly, examples that we have used to help shape the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program. And we make investments not knowing where they will take us or what ideas or opportunities they may give to future generations. We plant trees that we'll never sit under. That is leadership. That is Eisenhower. That is his legacy. And this is a quote that I think is particularly relevant to Kansas transportation, our nation as well. Our real problem is not our strength today. It is rather the vital necessity of action today to ensure our strength tomorrow. Next slide. So in many ways, over the last 10 to 12 years, Kansas, to be honest, kind of lost our way as it relates to infrastructure. More than $2 billion was removed from the state highway fund to cover, to cover other expenses. And as a consequence, the strength of our highway system took a hit, as you would expect. And Kansans, in 2018 and 2019, said, no, no, infrastructure is too important. And by 2020, we passed the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program with four hours to spare before legislators went home for a short session because of COVID. And I'm pleased to tell you, with a huge majority, 95% of all legislators, Republican and Democrats, su support the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program. And I'm here to tell you the story of why. It comes back, though, to the recognition that we have to take action today to make our tomorrows safer, more secure, and more prosperous. Next slide, Maggie. So, okay, how did Eisenhower come up with this idea of an interstate system? Well, you know, it goes back to 1919 when he was a young lieutenant colonel, and there was a convoy, an international, or a, a convoy that went from um, D.C. to San Francisco. 81 vehicles participated, and it took 62 grueling days. Next slide, Maggie. Because they got stuck. There really, there were not highways at all. In many cases, it was just barely a dirt path. They got stuck, Maggie. A lot. And they had to push their way, in some cases, across the country. Next slide. And thus he realized, hmm, there's probably a better way, as our country is growing, for us to be better connected and to be more prosperous. Now, we, I, we thoroughly enjoyed celebrating the 50th anniversary of the interstate in, 20, uh, in 2006. We recreated the convoy, and when I say we, I don't mean like Kansas, I mean the whole country celebrated and put a convoy together. And I recall vividly when we landed in Abilene and had the chance to celebrate there as well. Next slide. And there, Sally Howard, who was chief counsel of KDOT at the time, and this was my first tour of duty, uh, we had the chance to participate in that convoy. It was, yes, a ton of fun. And side note, my, um, my in every respect, I would say, you've got to give your hats off, no pun intended, to soldiers. We actually got to wear helmets from uh, the World War II time period, and they are heavy. And I thought about day after day having to carry that on your head and what it would do to your neck muscles and your upper shoulder muscles. So while having fun there, there was a distinct understanding, not full understanding, but an understanding that, wow, some of the sacrifices our soldiers went through. Next slide. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the power of and and why it was um, so important then and I think uh, even more important now. So Eisenhower understood that we needed a connecting system from sea to shining sea of interstates and defense highways. He understood that there were multiple roles that this new interstate system could play. 
he wrote in one of his in his memoir, the old convoy, you know, the one that kept getting stuck, started me thinking about good two lane highways. But when I was in Germany, I saw the wisdom of broader ribbons across the land. That's when he saw how very efficient movement could be. Maggie, next slide. So we may have thought that the interstate system was just an obvious investment. Wrong. He had to fight very hard to make it happen. And here's, I think, the brilliance of this and piece. He had the vision for what needed to be done and the perseverance and the talent to execute on that vision. Now, the original Highway Act was passed in 1954 and it authorized $175 million in what was a 60-40 split, 60% federal funds, 40% state funds. Ike was wise enough to call it a good start. In 1955, he proposed bonding over $25 billion to build the interstate system and Congress defeated the measure. In 1956, he tried to make it again a priority through his State of the Union address. And he agreed to raise the gas tax and have the, gov the federal government pay 90%. And states were then asked to contribute 10%. He signed the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 one week before July 4th. He would write in his memoir in 1963, more than any single action by government since the end of the war, this one would change the face of America. Its impact on the American economy, the jobs it would produce in manufacturing and construction, rural areas would open up, was beyond calculation. What he recognized then is every bit is true today about infrastructure. We need to relieve congestion. We need to provide for growth. We need to strengthen our national defense. We need to reduce the toll of human life. And we need to promote economic development. It is fundamental to the way we want to live our lives to have good basic infrastructure. Which brings me to what I talk about a lot and I think is at the very heart of the Ike program. Sure, transportation and infrastructure, it's about roads and bridges and it's about transit and airports and waterways and so much more. And the so much more part are the people. So that is how we put the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program, which is a 10-year, $10, $10 billion program for Kansas. That is how we built it. Next slide. We built it on partnerships, working with communities, cities and counties, and business leaders. We built it to provide more options so we don't always have to look at a monolithic approach. It doesn't, it's not always a highway solution. It's not always a transit solution. Their communities face lots of problems lots of challenges, and sometimes transportation is that problem. Sometimes transportation can help address part of the problem. And fundamentally, KDOT is here to help people solve problems. All right, so we are a catalyst and a connection point to healthcare, to education, to jobs and technology. I'll be, I'm happy to talk a bit more about broadband in just a minute, which we saw through the pandemic, how vitally important it was to these remote services. But we also have to think about the importance of getting people to dialysis, particularly in rural areas. It's very hard to access services. Technology is a wide open frontier and there is so much promise and opportunity as it relates to technology. When I think about catalyst and connection, I think about communities, and it's not that you can't do your work without us, but I'd like to think your work can be a little bit easier with us. I'd also like to point out um, President Eisenhower's commitment to safety. This is a picture from the first ever Highway Safety Conference. I want to I want to emphasize that, yes, we have seat belts now, and we have innovations in cars, and we think that technology of the future will be so very valuable in driving down our fatality rate. But in Kansas, we have an unacceptably high fatality rate. In rural areas particularly, it's worrisome. We don't have enough shoulders. We drive way too fast. We don't all wear our seatbelts. I read every single fatality report. There, Some of them are absolutely heartbreaking. So I encourage you, I implore you, wear your seatbelt. Slow down, particularly in construction zones, please. All right. So a couple of additional lessons from Ike. He was a decisive leader. 
He listened to experts to form his decisions. This is exactly what the Eisenhower program is built on. First, we're gonna listen and be responsive. Next slide. More than 2,000 Kansans participated across the two years to help us understand both the principles, identify a vision, and then put programs together so that we could systematically achieve that vision. I appreciate their participation. We're in the midst of local consult right now. We've had four meetings and we have four more to go. I'm so pleased with the participation rate and the stay on rate. We're doing them remotely and people have stayed till the very end. I appreciate that. All right. Under the Ike program, we kept some of the best of the old programs under, T under T-Works, the previous 10 year program, and we built some new programs based on input. And I'm gonna share some of those examples with you. The new programs are the ones that are identified by the yellow buttons. Most importantly, a new change to the way Kansas does transportation. Under the previous three 10 year programs, we'd identify a list of projects at the beginning of 10 years and then systematically work our way through adding lanes and interchanges and making improvements. Those are called uh, modernization and expansion projects. When I came back to KDOT, I was like, nah. you know, like maybe we can still do that, but the world seems to be changing too rapidly. We have too many opportunities. And the downside to that previous approach was that if a community had an opportunity and if they hadn't made it into the pipeline, if their project hadn't been identified, they had to wait 10 more years. That need often didn't go away and they had more needs. We've undone that process. We now have a rolling 10 year program where we identify new projects every two years. And we have many more program opportunities as you see in the yellow buttons for people to be able to access what I would call our portfolio of programs. We have a much more accessible program so we can help communities solve problems much faster. Communities also told us like, hey, it's not just about highways. We need to uh, have more investment in, um, in technology, in aviation, in transit services, in rail. And we have put those new programs into place across the Ike program. Um, we also, in our program, reflecting some of Ike's um, principles, is to be flexible and focus intently. Many of us think of Eisenhower as a stoic figure, and that's probably true, but above all, he was practical. And that meant when he governed, he was both flexible and adaptable, and he paired that with an intense focus. So for example, next slide. Now remember I said, the need for an interstate system was clear, but the funding it as per usual, the money was the problem, right? And he was trying to figure out how to, how to get people to pay for it. And he tried it first as a public works uh, program. That didn't work in Congress. He was flexible in his argument because not only was it the interstate system, it's the defense system. And he began to explain to folks that, hey, remember this was during the Red Scare, we may need to evacuate cities quickly. And that is part and parcel of the purpose of the interstate system. It was a real scare. And that was when the tide began to turn. So Eisenhower had a laser-like focus about this interconnected highway system. Now, how it got paid for, he was flexible on that. And it was really on the defense side that he had the most success. So, flexible and adaptable. Eyes focused in Kansas on preservation. Remember I told you we went through some really lean years? We need to rebuild our highway system the value of our highway system is north of $30 billion in Kansas. It's one of the state's most valuable assets. It had begun, the condition had begun to deteriorate. Now we've allocated $5 billion to rebuild our highway system. Now, as a practical matter, when you're out repaving or rebuilding in many cases that system, we're gonna go ahead and open up a trench. And if we need fiber, broadband fiber, if we need that for our future use so that at some point highways are gonna to need to talk to cars and to trucks particularly, we put that fiber in. Or if we don't, and that's along our priority freight corridors, if we don't anticipate a need there first, we'll go ahead and pay the mobilization costs, open the trench, and invite the private sector in on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's a lease, sometimes it's another arrangement where we just want to be able to access some of that fiber in the future. And we are therefore able to much more cost effectively get broadband across our rural state. 
because we're essentially paying for the mobilization and demobilization costs. I'm pleased to tell you we've got two projects that are um, going out shortly uh, in Kansas under this new Preservation Plus program. It's just practical. We're already out there, so we want to make the best use of our dollars. Now, so Ike didn't particularly care where a good idea came from. He just wanted good ideas. So he valued ideas and he valued the urgency that the private sector often brings to bear. In fact, his cabinet was full of business leaders. His first secretary of defense was the CEO of General Motors and his second was the head of Procter and Gamble. I think there might have been a few uh, examples where he saw the benefit of private sector urgency. And this is something that I try to bring to KDOT every single day, having been on both sides. We have public sector principals here at, at KDOT, and we are working very hard to rebuild our system with private sector urgency. So back to Ike and, the con and his convoy days, and he realized as he saw the logistical nightmares that were coming about at, through World War II, he saw that France and Germany had invested in their roadway systems after the First, world, after the first War, and he adapted a private sector idea he decided to take over these highways and turn them into one-way expressways straight through the heart of Europe. Now, where did he get that idea? Well, in America, in the 20s and 30s, freight was delivered by express, and it was marked by a red ball by private freight companies. He renamed these roads. These expressways would become known as red ball highways, and every time a soldier would uh, see that, he would understand it was the way to fast delivery and moving tons of supplies. In many ways, the general copied lessons learned from the private sector to move critical supplies. Likewise, I'm pleased to talk a bit about a new program called the Cost Share Program, where the state puts some money in, local communities put some money in. It can be a highway project, it can be a local road, it can be a bridge, a transit project, multiple kinds of projects. We stood that program up. We conceived it, built criteria, issued a call for projects, scored projects, and, I, and uh, notified winners of their awards, their grant awards, in 92 working days. We continue to work at pace on cost share. We have a program called Innovative Technologies. Uh, one of the programs that we're happy to support is unmanned aerial systems, otherwise known commonly as drones. It's critically important that we maintain in Kansas our place as the air capital of the world, and we will only do that through investing in technology and creating a world-class workforce. Broadband, I've already talked a bit about when we are already out doing work, we'll run fiber for uh, infrastructure purposes and to help uh, get fiber across the state more cost-effectively. Likewise, there's a, a smaller program at $5 million per year that's jointly administered by KDOT and the Kansas Department of Commerce Likewise, it's an application process for more like the last mile segments of broadband. And Ike totally understood transportation is a public good and we want to leverage every dollar of every investment. So sometimes those investments, Maggie, come in, um, come in really obvious ways when you are building a highway. But sometimes if you step back and take a look at the total impact we know that Fort Riley generates close to $2 billion in economic impact in the state of Kansas. And we are very proud for Fort Riley to be located here in Kansas, and we appreciate the opportunities to partner with them. So in short, some of the lessons that we learned from Ike, the president, Ike, the general, for Ike, our transportation program, be flexible. Be focused. I've talked about the adaptability, the rolling nature of the program so that we can be successful today and well into the future. To listen and learn. Good ideas can come from everywhere. We know we're going to get good ideas when we listen to citizens. We know the private sector can be a very helpful partner. And transportation is a public good, whether it is something you can tangibly see in the moment or it's more of a, a building and a community asset without question, transportation is a public good. So this and piece, it's not enough to just solve a single problem. I love it. The general knew the importance of a defense system, the interstate to provide for defense. The president knew the value of economic opportunities. That is the power of and. I enjoy 
the lessons that I get to learn about the Ike stories that I get to share, I also really enjoy when I get to visit the library. And this table, um, for me anyway, was it was the most is the most moving piece in the entire library because what hit me when I looked at that table is I realized like we know now how World War II ended up. Sitting there that day, they didn't know. And that assessment of risk and the weight of the world had to have been on their shoulders. And it, that really um, gives me pause. And it makes me think about that earlier quote about the need for action today to secure our tomorrows. And literally, the fate of the world rested on his shoulders in that moment. And after a long silence, he said, OK, we'll go. And thank God. His order mobilized 7,000 ships manned by over 195,000 troops from eight countries. It was the largest armada the world had ever seen. And its success turned the tide of the war. And half, when you think about how thin the margins were for success, there were more than a thousand things that could go wrong and not that many things that were probably going to go right. It was a scary moment. It was so thin, in fact, Maggie, that he penned an in case of failure note that's now at the museum. And he gave full credit to the brave soldiers and the airmen and the sailors and then did what good leadership does and accepted any responsibility for failure. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it's mine alone. So, I mean, I just, that just gives me pause. I want to acknowledge in this picture a really delightful time that we had last summer in 2020 when we had the opportunity to dedicate a sign celebrating the 50th anniversary of I-70. So not the interstate, but the completion of I-70. And I had the pleasure and the honor to meet uh, his granddaughter, Mary. And as part of that event, she told a story I hadn't heard before, and we all enjoyed it. So when Ike uh, left the White House, he retired to a farm close to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And you can see he's leaning up against a car that he bought to drive to town with Mamie. Now, think about this. Here is a career where he's been a highly successful, you know, military guy. And then he's the president. So he really never drove. He loved the interstate. He didn't have a driver's license. So now he goes to, to Pennsylvania and it's, it's time to buy a car and it's time to get a driver's license. And he does both. And he loves his car. He loves his car. He loves to drive his car fast. Sheriff had to come by more than once and say, sir, now imagine, this is like you're talking to the guy that saved the free world. Sir, you just got to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> so I enjoyed that story considerably. All right. So as Kansans, we owe a great deal to Eisenhower. And at KDOT, we probably owe a bit more. It's his vision that gives us purpose today. We've learned from his examples, and we keep trying to put those into practice. So Ike understood that it's the interstates that connect us. In Kansas, I like to talk about how transportation is our connecting fiber. It puts urban and rural areas together. It brings Democrats and Republicans together. It's about roads and bridges and airplanes and all those component pieces. It brings them together and builds a state that we want to be in today and into the future. At KDOT, we are working hard to live up to the legacy of the Eisenhower Transportation Program, Legacy Transportation Program. I truly believe that we are here to make Kansas a little bit better every single day. And um, I think most days we're doing it. Thank you so much, everyone. I would welcome any kind of conversation or however you all handle this next portion of the, of the Lunch and Learn. All right, well, I wanna say thank you so much. Um, 
to you, Secretary Lorenz, and open up the floor for questions. You can write them in the, type them in the chat if you'd like, or you can unmute yourself at this time if you're online um, and ask your question. Um, in a few minutes, if you're on the phone, I'll ask you to unmute yourselves. Well, I did have a question that you kind of answered at the end. So, uh, but my question was essentially, do you think that the Kansas transportation system is, ha has lived up to or is exceeding um, President Eisenhower's expectations and, or maybe his dreams and his goals for the interstate system? That's a really good question. So I think the answer is a bit of both. So has the interstate system lived up to his vision? Absolutely. It connects us all points. So that part, yes. What we have seen, um, like everything in life, there's a cycle. And there have been times where we have not fully funded the interstate system in a way for it to be in good, to, for it to be in good condition. Then there are times where we invest and it, and it swings back up and then it's in good condition. I think what we have to think about going forward, actually where I think we are not doing a great job as a nation, is in thinking about what is the vision for what's next, okay? Interstate system has served us well. It was a masterful vision. Now we need to think about what comes next. And when you think about the future of driverless cars, you know, you hop in your pod and it takes you from place to place, or it may be a drone and they're more like air taxis at some point. And we think about electric vehicles and how are we going to charge electric vehicles? It, there is a world of opportunity and we need the next vision for us all to pull together in the same direction to deliver the next vision. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? I mean, I have another one, but I can hold off. <laughs> You're a good moderator to have a couple of questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I'll ask this question um, because it, it applies to where I came from and it applies to my new home here in Kansas. But I, I come from Florida where we have three major interstates running through the state plus a, a turnpike system. Um, and yet there are so many parts of the state that the interstate or the turnpike isn't easily accessible. So for example, I'm originally from Panama City and it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get to I-10, which is the closest interstate to us. Um, do you think, or, or what is the solution, I guess? Do you think it's a federal solution or a state solution to get better highway access? Because I've encountered that same kind of, I don't know if I want to call it a problem, but you know, I drove to uh, Wichita when I first got here, and that was on a two-lane road. Um, how do we meet that solution of getting better interstate access to rural areas? That is a really good question and, a, um, and an important challenge. So, you know, we, as a practical matter, we can't afford to have interstates in all parts of all states. That, As a practical matter, that doesn't work. So you have to go through a prioritization process. So the interstate is a great backbone and you need to have good access to that backbone. In Kansas, what we talk a lot about, um, and the, it would be part of these modernization and expansion projects, is making sure then that the state highway system feeds to the interstate. Just as importantly though, we need to make sure that city streets and county roads can get to the state highway system that can then get to the interstate. So it's that interconnectedness, that network approach that's so important. And an example would be in Kansas, we have 25,000 bridges. Of those 25,000 bridges, 5,000 are the state are on the state system, 20,000 are local bridges because we are an agricultural state and many of those were built on a one mile grid system when we had small family farms. We still have small family farms, but we also have some large corporate farms. And today the challenge is as much access as on those bridges to make sure they're um, strong enough and wide enough for today's loads. So we're always sort of, you because investments in transportation are so expensive 
and they need to last a very long time. We have to be very intentional about not just what do we need today, but what do we project we're going to need in the future. Safety has to be top of mind. A good example would be we can't afford to build four lanes everywhere all the time. We absolutely need four lane highways, but we can't have them everywhere. So in some cases, we look at passing lanes as a good near term improvement, not thinking that it's the ultimate solution, but it can just provide some safety and it can also provide an opportunity for um, big loads, heavy, heavy uh, agricultural loads to make their way to the interstates as well. Yeah, the passing lane was very new for me. And you know what we need to do is we need to make sure we're signing those so people know that there is going to be a passing opportunity and it kind of um, decreases both the anxiety and like the urge to pass if you just know they're coming. So that is something that we have taken as an item to make sure we're, we're signing our passing lanes well. All right. Jump in any time because I do have one more question, <laughs> but I, I don't want to manipulate the time. Let's see, anything in the chat? Um, nope, not in the chat. Okay, well, I asked my last question. Okay. Um, you kind of mentioned, you know, that some of the roads are owned by, or some of the bridges are owned by um, like county mm -hmm. or um, like small towns and things like that. Um, how are, how is that decision made? Like who, takes care of the road, who takes care of the bridge? How does it build up to from- Well, that's a really good question. To, to federal. Sure, that's a really good question. Really good question. So, well, and I would say it evolves. So sometimes um, we will, uh, so maybe we're gonna build a bypass of a, of a town, you know, and that's gonna be a new four lane bypass. And that then will be the state's responsibility. We will have a conversation with the town, so the road that goes through it currently, and say, hey, we build the bypass, that adds more lanes for us to take care of. Are you willing to take what used to be the state highway that might have been a two lane through town, are you willing to take over the maintenance of that? We need you to take over the maintenance of that because we can't continue to increase our inventory. That's one example. Um, sometimes we have, this is called a city connecting link, so you may be driving through a town on a two lane, maybe even a four lane highway, and you think it feels like a city street, but it's actually a state highway. We have an agreement. We pay for the maintenance of state highways that go through, through cities. So, and these are arrangements that have been developed over many, many, many years. We also, I, I, because I take a real systems view of all of this, so we have programs like this uh, cost share that we will use some state dollars if local communities will bring some local dollars and we'll help uh, rebuild some of that infrastructure or make improvements because um, we've got some, some communities out there that just can't fund all of the work that they need to have done. But what we do require is a bit of a contribution so that we're working together in partnership. So there are lots of different kinds of arrangements. And then of course we have our federal partners and we make sure that when we are designing our highways uh, that they are eligible for federal aid, which means we make sure we do like all the environmental work properly. We get all the permits so that as we receive federal funds, we can then take those federal funds and apply those to state projects. Federal funds, kind of depending on the year, make up, you know, I would say like 25% of our revenue, 25, 30% of our revenue. Some states, federal dollars make up well over 50%. So it sort of depends on how much your state has valued, um, you know, transportation investments. All right, well, thank you for that. Um... Again, any, anyone have any questions? If you're on the phone, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. If you have one, it's star, star six to unmute. You may have to press it more than once to, for it to actually go through, uh, but please feel free to ask your questions. We'll give you a few minutes, and if we don't have any questions, then I'll make our last announcement, and we'll all go home. Or log off, go back to work. Well, I'll just say, I think it's a real, 
it is an it's an honor and it's a pleasure to have a a program that's named after someone that is so important and influential and there are so many good stories to then sort of say well here's an eisenhower story and here's how that can be helpful in kansas today right well it doesn't seem like anybody anyone has any questions so i'm going to go ahead and move us forward um to oh wait a minute is that a question oh no so thank you um you're welcome um so i'm going to go ahead and move us forward to the end. So let me share my screen again. All right. So uh, the 2021 public program series is made possible thanks to the Eisenhower Foundation and the Jeff Cope Foundation. Oh, too many. All right. We have several great programs lined up for you as we get closer to closing out the year. Our October evenings at ease program is scheduled for Tuesday, October 12th, where we will welcome Rex Buchanan and he will talk about water, energy and rural Kansas. And um, our theme for next month is in energy. Our book talk uh, will meet again on November 9th to discuss the book, The Things They Carried. Next month's Lunch and Learn program will feature the International Atomic Energy Agency, and it is scheduled for Thursday, October 28th. You can keep up to date on all of our upcoming events by visiting our website at the eisenhowerlibrary.com. So thank you again, Secretary Lorenz, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you to Steve uh, for all of, all of your assistance in, in helping set this up. I really appreciate it. Um, and if there are no more questions or comments, I'll say goodbye to everyone. And you all have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.